but first off, uh, why are we here today? Because we just had a wonderful webinar uh, about two weeks ago. We had uh, many high-end professionals giving their thoughts and perspectives on using generic PROMs in Finland. And I say that I think it was uh, an evening full of information, and I hope you didn't find it too overwhelming. At least I enjoyed it a lot. But now, uh, Heli, Heli Valkeinen and me, we, we wanted to get some international perspective also. So that's why we called Norway. And uh, we thought that Norway as a country uh, has a lot of similarities to Finland. Of course, we have our differences too. And no Norway has a lot longer history in uh, managing national quality registers than we do in Finland. So we thought that maybe maybe we could learn something from them. Maybe they have already tackled some problems that we are now facing. So here we have today Mario Lane Memelink Iversen. Uh, who's a professor from Department of Health and Caring Sciences in Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. She also works as a special advisor on uh, Center of Patient Reported Outcomes Data, Hokeland Uni University Hospital. And we have online also three other persons from Norway. Charsti Oterhals, who's a, a special advisor, Inger Elise Engelund, who works as an advisor, and Kire Breivik, who works as a psychologist, and they all work in the Center of Patient Reported Outcomes Data uh, in uh, Haukeland University Hospital. So you can also ask them online on chat, and they'll be there answering your questions. And uh, the stage is yours, Mario Lane. Thank you, and thank you for your kind introduction. I will share my presentation. And yes. And do you see my presentation? Maybe. Oh, box. You see? Yes, we can see that and we can Good. hear you perfectly fine. Good. Uh, I don't see the chat, so if there is something coming up in the chat, maybe you or one of the others can, can just um, give a notice about this. Um, yes, this. thank you for the invitation to this webinar to give a presentation about our experiences uh, with patient reported outcome measures and national quality registers in Norway. Um, what is this lecture about? It's a short introduction about the Center of Patient Reported Outcomes and the situation in Norway. It is about from in the Norwegian quality registries. Uh, I will uh, give some examples related to the EQ5D and tell some about the uh, around 1236. And in the end, we will have some reflections on from for use of uh, reflections on use of from for follow up in clinical care. Um, we are working at the Center for Patient Reported Outcomes, and um, since 2015, we have served all national quality registries in Norway and the Center on Patient Reported Outcomes is a national resource on PROM and PREM. And we facilitate guidance on use of PROM and PREM in national uh, quality registries. And in addition, we give advice regarding research in the registries. We have some local or regional quality registries and we serve them as well as they may intend to become a national quality register. As the web page is in Norwegian, there is some Norwegian text. I'm sorry for that. On this slide, uh, we see the people, persons working at our center. 
Um, some of them are here today. And most uh, most people are working part time, having part time positions, and in total we are 2.1 men, yes. And Ingrid Elise Engeland is coordinating the center. And she is here today as well. Shared decision making, nothing about me without me. And I think this is key regarding patient reported outcome measures and patient reported outcome measures in the quality registries. Uh, what are pros and how can the concept be defined? Uh, this is a definition from the Department of Health and Human Service Food and Drug Administration, and it is used as guidance for industry and patient reported outcome measures are as well used in medical product development to support labeling claims. Um, in Norway, uh, we have the Ministry of Health and Care, Care Services, uh, which is responsible for providing good and equal health and care services for the population of Norway. And over the years, it has been very explicit and communicated clearly that the patient's voice need to be included in evaluating the quality of care. And it is expected that it is a part of continuous quality improvement work. And by directly involving patients in the evaluation process, PROMS provides valuable insights into healthcare services from the patient's perspective. And on this slide, we see the wording, how it was framed in the last um, paper from the uh, ministry to the health, um, to the hospitals. And it is very clear that quality data from the quality registers actively in the work on quality improvement, patient safety, and as well as to reduce unwanted variation. Um, a little bit about the organization. Sorry, this slide is as well in Norwegian, but I will explain. Uh, under the umbrella of the S. KDE, it's the cent it means the Center for Clinical Documentation and Evaluation. Um, all services are given to the national quality registries. And the national service environment um, um, uh, are organized by the uh, by the Center for Clinical uh, Documentation and Evaluation. So this national service environment is under this umbrella and their own patient reports and outcomes is a part of this national environment. And through the years, just in the organization, but this is not important for now. Um, and national quality registers in Norway are established by dedicated health professionals in the health services. And when establishing a quality register, the relevant patient group is defined and it is clarified on which quality challenge there is need for more knowledge. Uh, and based on this, relevant quality indicators are defined and relevant examples of outcome vari variables, how the treatment works are, for example, patient reported outcome measures such as perceived pain and quality of life or a given before and after surgery, symptom scores before and after given treatment, or perceived benefits of treatment. And we will come back to this. Yes, one more picture from the website from the National um, um, uh, Service Environment. Uh, at this, there is a joint website for all registries 
and each register has a separate uh, page with information as updated information on quality indicators and information on quality indicators is on this web page then and we have three types as you know structure process and result variables and it is possible to put a name or, or just a disease in this fields and then the registry is uh, appearing and this is an example of the Norwegian hub and this picture of the web page showing some of the quality indicators for example the indicator for treatment with beta blockers is this is here in Norwegian um, the quality indicator for treatment with beta blocker is 90 percent and the goal uh, or more and the proportion of 94 percent and the green color demonstrate that this goal is achieved. Another example of a um, um, quality indicator is the proportion of uh, the quality indicator for filling out a quality of life questionnaire. And the goal is a proportion of 90% or more and the proportion is 90% and the green color demonstrate that this goal is achieved. And as we say, see below, all the quality indicators need more work. Um, in this presentation, uh, the number of registries can vary somewhat as new registries are coming and some registries are not fulfilling the criteria for being a national quality registry anymore. And in addition, this presentation will focus mainly on the registries, um, including adults, and we have as well registries for children. But overall, we have 59 national quality registries as per the 1st of March this year. Um, and the aim is to contribute to better quality in patient care and treatment. Uh, and data is received from specialist healthcare. The exception is the National Diabetes Registry for adults. They receive as well data from the GP offices regarding especially type 2 diabetes. And the quality registry plays play a crucial role in monitoring and benchmarking healthcare outcomes in Norway and the registers uh, track the effectiveness and safety of various interventions. And in addition, they enable the identification of best practices, facilitate quality improvement initiatives and support evidence based decision making. Uh, when we are looking to the population coverage for the quality registers, uh, there are large differences between registries. And these are numbers from 2020. Uh, coverage range will as well vary over time, but it can give an indication. And the registries were asked how large part of the whole patient population does the quality register cover. And uh, the coverage rate uh, is an important criteria as well uh, for being allowed to be a national quality registry. And as you see, 62% of the quality registers uh, have a, a coverage rate between 80 and 100%. 23% have a coverage rate between 60 and 80%. And some of the registries are below, below this, this. Some are recently uh, started or established um, uh, and there can be other reasons why they have this low coverage rates 
and if this is continuing over time, um, um, they may be not furthermore allowed to be a national quality register. And then we can ask what is the among the 58 quality registers, what is the coverage rate for ROMs in these registries? And I had hoped to see the chat so I could ask you to place in the chat. Um, can you? Um, can you uh, suggest what the coverage rate for the PROMs in the quality registers is in Norway? So maybe you can just put in your your um, suggestions. What is the coverage rates for problems in the quality registries in Norway? Is it 20% or 40%, 60%, 80%. Yes, I see there is a large difference, but yes, now I have uh, tried to, to see the chat and I see there is a large difference between the suggestions from 10% to 90%. So, yes, and then I can just um, maybe tell you that we started quite low in 2017 and uh, the national goal of 85% was achieved in 2021 and at the moment we have 98% uh, of the quality registries that have uh, chosen or implemented from in the registries. And in 2021, uh, 33 of the registries published results for the broad patient reported outcome data. So we are very, very happy for that. Um, we have as well EPROM. Previous, the mode of administration was paper questionnaires but our centre has actively stimulated the, <clears throat> the use of web questionnaires, EPROM, and for a five-year period, for a five-year period, we have had funding to facilitate the implementation of EPROM and web questionnaires, collecting directly data to the registry. And we have a depart an IT department in one of the four health regions, uh, which has been given the responsibility to, to develop and operate a system for collecting patient reported data for the national quality registries. Um, and quite many of the, I don't have the exact number, but uh, quite many of the registries have implemented EPROM at the moment. We will see an example of this later on. Um, as we have quite long time, I have decided to have some uh, questions after 15 minutes approximately, so that that um, uh, you can ask questions if you have some. I will, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Marilene. I I knew it that we do have a lot of things to learn from you. Sounded great. Hey, uh, Heli, do we have any questions from the chat? Okay, because uh, 
I have one that's burning my mind. You mentioned the uh, quality of life questionnaires, uh, the coverage in was it in uh, heart registry, something like 90 percent. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Really? Yes. So uh, <laughs> that just sounds pretty amazing to me. How did you do it? And do you do you mean 90 percent in the baseline or did you have uh, also the follow up? Um, uh, we will see about the heart failure registry a little bit more afterwards. Um, and um, um, I think the, the uh, 90% um, is meant uh, one of the of the points they are reporting. Uh, it can be the baseline, but it can of course as well be later on. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, and because maybe, mm. And if if Inger Elisa or Cher would like to to sip, uh, to to tell more about this, just please. Uh, uh, I think the types. the main reason why the heart failure registry is so successful is because they have very eager uh, clinicians, and they have been working with this for a long time, mm. before we started. Uh, so it uh, and that's something we see quite often that uh, the more eager clinicians, the better the uh, the registries. Mm -hmm. And do you call it the there with? Uh, do you call it there with EPROMs? Is it electronic? And uh, not with the heart failure, I think. I think this is one of the few registries mm. not collecting EPROMs at the moment. Yes. But they're probably going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, can I ask what is the particular generic prom they are using in that registry? Uh, I will show you on the slide afterwards. I I think it was the EQ5, uh, the EQ5D, but I am a little bit unsure. It might be the round, round mm -hmm. question, but I will show you on the slide later on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, we have a question from the chat, I believe. Heli? Yes, I think I see it. So, is there a common shared solution of electronic from for the EHRS? Uh, um, yes, there is a, a common shared solution for the electronic PROM, uh, which is um, um, given by the the IT department from one of the uh, health health um, health uh, health authority talk health uh, authority regions regions yes please yeah. thank you and um, in this way these are as well connected but maybe you can tell more about this thing Elisa connected to uh, solutions everybody is using. Uh, to receive health information. Because mm. uh, uh, the health uh, uh, myth, also the, the, the region in the middle of Norway, uh, they got the, uh, the, uh, and the work of um, uh, and paid to, to make this EPROM solution that they offer to all the, the registries. Uh, and the main task has been to uh, make this solution uh, communicate with the system that uh, registries use to collect the other data into their registry. And that's where the money goes. So when we, um, like Marilyn, told that we have been uh, supporting the registries for over the years with, I think it will be up to two, two, no, one and a half million Norwegian kroner. Uh, most of that has been to develop um, how the EPROM solution should uh, communicate with, uh, uh, with the solution, as I said, to collect the other data to the registries. Uh, so yes, there is there is a common system for all uh, shared solution, as the question is, for all the registries. That they can choose to uh, use, it's not mandatory. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think should we move on or what do you think, Marilyn? Yes, we can move on. Thank you. Okay, go on. Um, yes, 
uh, this picture is showing the increase in publications, including patient reported outcomes. And it is interesting uh, that the patient's voice now is included in so many studies. And these are data from PubMed. Um, I will just uh, um, mention that patient reported outcomes in study protocols and national quality registers need to be aware of this. Uh, this is showing the guidelines for inclusion of patient reported outcomes in clinical trials protocols. And this is the Spirit Pro extension and they provide recommendations for items that should be addressed and included in clinical trial protocols in which pros are primary or uh, key secondary outcomes. And this should help to improve design of clinical trials and ensure high quality data. And this may inform the quality, uh, inform the quality registers as well. And another thing is that there is as well another guideline. Um, uh, it's the reporting of patient reported outcomes in randomized controlled trials is guided by the it's not a guideline it's guided by the consort pro extension and this paper describes the development of the consort pro extension and it is an important issue for studies using registry data so when choosing data to the registries uh, it is important to be aware of these um, um, consortiums and guidelines. And a uh, last thing is I would like to mention is the ICHOM initiative. Uh, it's the International Consortium for Health Outcomes and is an example for diabetes. As you see, it's uh, all the aspects uh, integrated um, in and uh, 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 health for persons with diabetes are in, included in this uh, health outcomes. The patient reported outcomes, the diabetes control, health services, chronic complications and acute events and all these are included in the health outcomes including patient reported outcomes and is aimed to identify measures reflecting the concerns and experiences of people and in this example with diabetes. Um, and there is written a paper and this is not only for diabetes, it's for several, for, men, for very many of diseases. There is a standard set of person-centered outcomes uh, for patients groups and these are published and um, this results in, in an international and, and, uh, and common approach, unified approach. And um, for the diabetes, three instruments were recommended for annually measurements, uh, two generic and one more uh, disease specific. Um, and uh, for clinicians, utility based instruments are often is insufficient, uh, sensitive to change and not related to the disease construct, making it more difficult to use it in clinical context. And as well, these three instruments um, applied here where the PHQ9, the WHO5 and uh, PAID and not uh, one of the more generic as the EQ5D or the RAND questionnaire. There is as well giving a suggestion for measuring uh, points of the props and in this case it was a baseline and annually. Uh, and in this way, for many of the disease groups, we can have a suggestion where to start and how to choose uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, regarding the measurement 
choices and level of prompts. I would just like to mention the uh, Spilker um, triangle. Spilker outlines quality of life at three interrelated levels. Uh, the overall assessment of well being, broad domains as physical, psychological, and social domain and components of each domain as disease specific symptoms and function. And quality of life instruments are either uh, single questions on an overall uh, quality of life, generic or disease specific, generic instruments referring to the middle of the triangle, a focus on more general issues rather than specific uh, features of a particular disease and below the disease specific instruments focusing on symptoms or specific um, specific symptoms regarding the disease and when we are looking to to um, instruments single question an example is for instance the the who call breath single item or the run single item <clears throat> um, generic items it can be the run 12 or 36 or the eq 5d and regarding uh, or the sf6 and regarding the C specific instruments, it can be the hard call, the MIDAS, or the SAQ regarding health heart diseases. Um, the choice of measurement between the generic and the disease specific. Um, it is important to decide on the use of questionnaires and it is of great importance that the work facilitating these choices needs careful consideration. It's very easy to do it very quick and just decide it, but it, it really needs some time and uh, important consideration. Uh, generic questionnaires are giving the overall picture and informs with new knowledge uh, about how the quality of life is affected by the disease. It informs how side effects of various diseases and treatment can affect the quality of life and gives the possibility to compare across disease groups. Um, for disease specific questionnaires, this aims uh, to um, uh, to capture all important aspects of a specific disease impact on quality of life and it gives comparisons. It can be compared between institutions, national and international, and it is maybe uh, more clinical relevant, but cannot be compared across disease groups. And Across agrees groups, uh, disease groups, it's only the generic questionnaire. You have the possibility uh, between uh, disease groups. We have we can use the disease specific questionnaire, but we have to to be aware of that. Although everybody knows that we need time to decide. Uh, we observe that these weaknesses and strengths of the various prompts are not always assessed carefully enough uh, before a decision is taken. Um, more to our uh, national status, generic prompts in total 36 of out of 50, 52 of the registers um, that is either the adults uh, use a generic prom. Um, more of the, of the registries are using a disease uh, specific prom and many of them are using both, but 36, 69% are using a generic prom. And the EQ5D, the three or five L version, is used in 18 of the 36. So this is 50% of this of those using a prom. 
And uh, round, round 36, so the round 12, uh, is used in 11 of the uh, of the 36 um, quest, uh, registries. Uh, just this means 31%. Um, in addition, some registries use both questionnaires. And we have an other questionnaire, the WH DOS, which is especially used in mental health, but as well a few other registries are considering this questionnaire. Uh, the registry for mental health diseases for adults is using it at the moment. And regarding the uh, EQ5D, and we can tell more about this later on, we have a national license for the use of EQ5D in the national quality registries. Um, in addition uh, to this, um, both these generic outcome measures uh, are used uh, both the EQ5D and the RON36 are used as generic outcomes in the local and regional quality registers in Norway in many different patient groups. And this is beyond the numbers showing showed here. And then examples. And then uh, uh, the question of Lisa will be answered. <laughs> And this slide, we see the use of generic and disease-specific instruments in a couple of examples of registries. And we will see if they are collected prompts traditionally or by EEPROM, and uh, in addition, uh, which instruments they are using. Uh, the National Registry for uh, Heart Failure is using the PROM only traditional and not by EEPROM yet. They are using the EQ5D as a generic instrument and they have a disease specific instrument which is the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire. Another example is the Norwegian Diabetes Registry for Adults collects both, uh, collects from both um, traditional but mainly with the EEPROM. Uh, they are using the EQ5D and as a generic instrument and they have disease specific instruments as the PAID, the W05 and the gold scale as disease, more disease specific instruments. Although the W05 can be compared between disease groups Um, and we can just uh, underline that all registries are using disease-specific patient reported outcome measures. Uh, the number of registries collecting EQ5D data per registry, we don't have the, uh, this ni a nice overview as this for Norway. We have an overview, but this was for Sweden, and you see an overview uh, for the EQ5D data per registry category in Sweden. So these are the numbers of registries collecting EQ5D data per 2018. Uh, I would like to say uh, say a little bit about it. A little bit heavy slide, I know, but I would like to just underline when defining a generic prom what is important to be aware of. Um, the validity and the reliability are crucial, and the relevance to the population, the questions need to be relevant for the population, ensuring that the most important health outcomes are captured. And then we have feasibility and user acceptance, and that is needed factors as the length of the questionnaire, ease to completion, and the burden is important to have in mind when choosing a questionnaire. 
Then we have standardization and comparability. Preferable prompts that have established norms or reference values should be chosen. Uh, responsiveness to change and sensitivity to change are important. Uh, alignment with international standards using consider using prompts that align with international standards and recommendations. And last but not least, it's important to involve various stakeholders. And I would just stress especially and underline the relevance for the population um, the, uh, is, is of a special uh, relevance and the responsiveness and the sensitivity to change. And we will uh, come a little bit back to this responsiveness, responsiveness and sensitivity to change in some of the examples later on and the relevance to the population can be by the stakeholders. Uh, they can contribute to especially the relevance to the population. Yes, and I would ask some questions so far. Yes, thank you, Marjolaine, again. Uh, so uh, do we have questions from the chat? I believe at least we have a lively discussion there. On, but yeah. the <laughs> Can you? Are all the answers already, uh, I mean, the questions already answered or? No. The, no. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you can just highlight your, which question. If, if, Heli, if Heli, you can read out loud uh, a question and Marjolaine will answer or some of one of them. Hold on, we have problem with the mic. Heli, uh, should you come here? Because Hold on, <laughs> technical problems. No problem. <laughs> As always. OK, sorry, can, can you, you hear now? So this question is from Aapo Tahkola. A question regarding your excellent coverage of PROMS. Are there some extra incentive, incentives for patients to input information? If someone does not answer, is there someone like professional staff that calls for him? her to remind of it? Um, uh, I can uh, answer. There are not a special initiatives for the patients that they receive something or, or something like that. And it is possible with a reminder when patients haven't answered within, for example, two or four weeks. Uh, but it's this is different between the registries if they send a reminder or not. But there is a possibility to send a reminder. Um, and as it is mainly on EPROM at the moment. Um, uh, when it is different on paper, uh, I'm a little bit more unsure uh, how um, uh, if they receive a reminder, um, but maybe Engere Lisa can't uh, mm -hmm. supply. It, yeah. it varies. Uh, I know that uh, some of the registries, it depends on the size of the registries. If you have a small registry with, for instance, rare diseases, then you can more or less count the patients that are going to be included. But if it's uh, some of the heart failure registries, uh, you don't have the chance. But I know that somebody are allowed to call, some of the registries are allowed to call up their patients and, and kind of ask if they can ask uh, answer the question now. But maybe, maybe there is a little misunderstanding here because when 98% um, uh, uh, of the registries are using PROM. This does not mean that the coverage that 98% that yeah. of the patients in the registry is answering the PROM. 
So the answer rates are different from the cover rates. The cover rates is how many of the registries are using or have chosen a prom. Uh, and almost all registries have done that. Uh, but the coverage rate, the, the, the response rate of the PROM in the different registries uh, has uh, large differences from very good to, to less good. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give us an example? Like uh, where do those go, the answer rates? Um, just roughly, um, because that's uh, one, yeah. uh, one, one issue we, we actually yes, dealing quite, with. Yes, quite recently the diabetes registry sent out PROMs. Uh, uh, they sent last year and this year, uh, two years ago and this year. And for two years ago, they, um, I think among all they sent out uh, 65 percent, 60, 65 percent answered. So it was a quite high coverage rate, and especially when we think about it, it's a quite large register. So, so everybody in the register was quite happy with these high response rates, and there was as well done an um, an analysis uh, to see. The differences be between those, ans those answering and not answering, and this um, was as expected. Yes. And we know that a few of the registries have uh, projects to uh, try to increase the rate of uh, uh, of patients included in the registry that uh, answer the the prompts, uh, and they try in different ways to increase the rate. So, for instance, the registry for uh, epileptics, I think, the, yeah. So I think the answer is that it varies from 10% to 95%. Yeah, not a good mm. answer, but <laughs> it's the best <laughs> we have. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm. Thank you. Heli, did you have another one? Yes. Uh, Matti Reinikainen asks, I suppose the coverage persons referred to registers, not patients, right? What mm. persons of registered patients provide PROM data? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's what we just said that it varies uh, to that last question. Okay, mm. okay, yeah. so sorry. So yeah, then. That's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then Harry Sintonen asks, why to choose? the EQ5D, the worst performing in terms of discriminatory power and sensitivity among generic one index number held uh, related quality of life instruments? Yes, it's a good question and we will come back on this uh, further in the presentation. And I would just underline that our center is giving advice and um, discuss with the registries, but the, this, the, the registries themselves are choosing. We are not finally choosing uh, the prom for the registry. The registry uh, is independent and do that. We can just facilitate guidance and advice to them. Marjan, could I, could I just uh, throw in yeah. something there? And I think one of the main reason for choosing uh, AQ5D is, is it's the most used, so it's uh, easier to compare with international studies and things. And another thing is that it's um, AQ5D is very developed when it comes to economic evaluations, like the quality of life. Um, or, or, yes, and when they're, when they're using from data for economic evaluations and things, so uh, and cost benefits and and choosing between different kinds of treatments and yes, so I think that is one of the one of the most reasons why so many use, are using it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it it seems shorter than than the rod maybe, mm -hmm. uh, although they in time not use different time on this. But but, but it is an ongoing back. discussion in yeah. Norway as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. certainly. Is. Yes, uh, I have one question myself. What about uh, 
uh, comorbid comorbid patients like uh, diabetes that you have been talking about a lot to, to uh, this evening and uh, there's a lot of uh, comorbidity in comorbidity in that uh, patient group so is anyone there coordinating the generic proms or proms because they might be in multiple different registries these patients some of these patients yeah. have you thought about that hmm. um uh, we have um, discussed this a lot the people who are in different uh, registries and, for instance, people with an uh, heart arrest and heart attack and having heart surgery and having heart failure and everything happens within a month. Are they receiving all questionnaires from all the registries? And we have at the moment not a, a good, good answer on this and a good um, uh, because uh, this is one of the challenges when we have so many registers and all registers have prompts, how to uh, deal with this in a good way. And as far as I know, we, we do not have a good solution to that. Um, maybe when all the registries, uh, these heart registries are within one umbrella, that it can be coordinated. Uh, but uh, I do not. I don't think this is coordinated at the moment. Maybe you, Inger Elisa, know more about this. Yes, two of the registries have managed to coordinate. Two of the heart failure uh, registries, uh, the Norwegian. Um, uh, heart failure registry and the Norwegian registry for invasive cardiology. They have managed, they have just started to coordinate um, uh, when to uh, ask the patients to uh, to answer the questionnaires. Uh, so they, because they have uh, uh, common questionnaires and they uh, now they have uh, I can't say access, but then uh, they are they have coordinated distribution of the questionnaires in those two uh, registries. But many, as you as you uh, said, Lisa, that um, some of these patients can be in up to five or six or seven different registries, and uh, they will get tired <laughs> of answering mm, at mm -hmm. some point. Yeah. But then the relevance is again important. If the questions are relevant for them, they will answer. Mm. And oh, okay. one of the experiences with the EQ5D in the diabetes registry was as well that uh, people were calling about the EQ5D because they were asking, do you mean mobility regarding my mobility because I had a hip fracture last week? Uh, what? How should I think? So this can be one of the challenges when we have generic instruments for disease-specific registries. Yeah. Yes. But this will all be be a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Should we move on? You have one more session yes. to go. Mar okay. Yes. Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the questions. Um, so. Yes, and it was one. <clears throat> we received some questions of Lisa in beforehand, and one of the questions was, "How do you utilize all the data gathered with a generic pro practical examples?" So I will give some practical examples and presentations of the EQ5D5L data, and miss most um, uh, examples from this. As I have understand, you have uh, you have decided not to choose the round questionnaire. Uh, this is the EQ5D questionnaire for those of you who haven't seen it. It's about, it has five domains, the self-care, the usual activities, the pain, discomfort, and the anxiety and depression. This is the 5L version with five answer options, no problems, slight problems, moderate problems, severe problems, and unable to uh, do washing or dressing or yeah, the different domains. In addition, we have this VAS scale from the best health you can imagine with 100 and the worst health you can imagine with zero. Then you are not alive anymore. 
Um, this is um, uh, from the myocardial infarction register. Um, sorry for being in Norwegian, Norwegian. The example is from the annual report and the bar chart show frequencies counting um, um, for uh, with comparisons of data from 2018 and 2019. Um, uh, and it is presented by the five levels of uh, the domains. So regarding the first picture is regarding physical function and 70% report not to have a problem with walking around or usual activities, which is not surprising according to the annual report. On this side, it's usual activities and 84% has not a problem with this. So a bar chart and uh, displaying the um, frequencies for the different answer options is one possibility and for two years so you can see if there are differences between the years. Um, this is as well from the myocardial infarction registry, and this is from the bus scale, uh, the worst health you can imagine to the best, and we can see how um, the mean uh, score and uh, the medium score and the mean score is on this um, uh, for this um, uh, VAS scale. And this is cross-sectional. Another thing, this is from the neck and back registry, and this is from the first consultation. Um, and in the red box is the EQ5D index, the mean, and the VAS score, the mean scores. But here we have for different hospitals. We have four hospitals and the total score, the total uh, mean, and we focus now only on the EQ5D. So we see that the mean EQ5D index is almost the same, and the VAS score is slightly different, but quite the same. Some lower in the VAS. Um, Another way of presenting the EQ5D data is um, done by the hip fracture registry. Uh, they present, uh, visualize mobility problems before and after the hip fracture compared for different age groups. The different colors are different age groups. And these are answers on Question one, domain one of the EQ5D, the mobility, and this was before the fracture, and this was mobility problems after the fracture. And it is important, uh, the two things, this is the free L version and the scoring. Um, so problems are defined as alternative two and three, slight or severe problems. So only those not having problems are uh, not included here. And we can have in mind that reports from before the hip fracture, uh, these uh, reportings are retrospective, that they are answered three or four months after the um, after the fracture, because it's people are not knowing if they are getting a <laughs> a hip fracture, so it is res, uh, retrospective. Another way uh, of presenting from the hip fracture is they have different treatments. It's uncemented or cemented, and they have presented the EQ5D index score for the two treatments and we see there is not a difference between the two treatment alternatives.
Um, one more example from the uh, hip fracture registry. This is maybe a little bit heavy slide. Uh, these are all the hospitals in Norway. Um, and they present reporting mobility 12 months after primary hip surgery for 2017 and 18 um, for different hospitals in Norway. And it is the dark blue, it's no problems, the light blue, slight problems, and at the end is little light blue, not able to work. And in parentheses, the number of patients answering the questionnaire. And the figure shows that there are some differences in walking function between the different hospitals and the majority of patients at all hospitals have walking problems. And this is an overview of longitudinal, longitudinal studies of patients' health related quality of life by using the EQ5D3L in nine of the Swedish national quality registers. Uh, and these are comparisons between registries comparing the burden of different diseases on the patient's health. So the general population is at the bottom. And this is showing the mean VAS score uh, by diagnosis at baseline and one year follow up in the nine national quality registries. So this is another way between registries to present. Um, the next thing I will briefly report, there are some reports, some results from a study on the use of a generic and disease specific patient reported outcome measure in the description of health and Professor Norical was the PI of this study. And the aim of the study is to deter, was to determine floor and ceiling effects of a generic health utility instrument, the EQ5D5L, in an international multicenter cohort of patients after a PCI and further explore those with perfect health scores by using a disease specific instrument and for this population with a PCI it was the MIDAS. And results, um, we see that the large bar is showing those reporting not having problems on any of the domains. Self-care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, or depression. And, and so this is over 30%. And then we were looking into the score on the MIDAS, the disease-specific questionnaire, among those who had a perfect score on the EQ5D. So we investigated all those perfect scorers on the EQ5D if they scored as well perfect on a relevant disease specific questionnaire. And we see that they did not score that perfect. They had occasionally, sometimes, and often problems. And this was on all of, on, on different uh, of the uh, questions of the MIDAS. It was about uh, weight, it was about side effects, and it was about fatigue, uh, mainly. Um, and um, it, this is as well a little bit heavy slide, but the show, picture shows a latent class analysis on the MIDAS results and re revealed four classes. The first class the blue line uh, was major fatigue and side effects. The orange line, only some fatigue and side effects. Then we had the green line, this one, which was good cardiac quality of life. Um, 
like poor quality of life, quality of life, and the four uh, class, the purple one, this one, uh, was showing good quality, cardiac quality of life. And uh, there was a variation from 17 to 46 percent of the perfect scores. Uh, some did perceive challenges in health. Sorry that this is a quite busy, busy slide. On the bottom we see all the questions from the Midas. And when we summarize this, then there was a strong seal effect on the EQ5D5L with 32% scoring the best possible on the EQ5D5L score, suggesting perfect health. And among those with perfect scoring, the disease specific MIDAS revealed that the perfect score group did, however, perceive challenges in health. And latent class analy analysis on the MIDAS revealed four classes where 17 to 46 percent of the perfect scorers did perceive challenges in health and particularly related symptoms of fatigue and the worries about risk factors, side effects of medication were uh, reported. And this underlined that it is important to use both generic and disease specific instruments. Both are needed. Uh, this is a graphical abstract from this study, multi-center study with seven PCI centers. Uh, two and a half thousand patients were included, mostly men, uh, which is according the illness trajectory, and several measures of patient reported outcomes were used among the perfect scorers. Um, the health was not perfect when we used disease-specific questionnaires. So to obtain an accurate picture of the patient's health, both generic and disease-specific patient reported outcomes are needed to capture the distinct problems that patients with specific health condition experience. So if we look to the pro and the cons on EQ5D, um, the pros for EQ5D, and these are suggestions by us, and there are maybe more pros or more cons. Uh, generic questionnaires producing a health utility and a general health score. It has five domains with five answer options, which is quite short. Uh, and many populations can be compared, as Shira was saying, and it works reasonable well for health economics. However, if we know that there is a ceiling effect, we need to have this in mind because this can influence the health economics as well. Cons, it does not capture all aspects of health status, for example, the fatigue, the side effect of medication, and to a small extent as well, mental health. Um, yes, and as I was mentioning, the quality, the quality paradigm, the use of EQ5D would involve inaccurate qualities as um, there is maybe an um, uh, um, and estimates of the economic evaluations and the decisions taken were maybe not correct based that the AQ5D is not reflecting the health uh, good enough. A uh, ceiling effect be considered and I don't know how it is in Finland, in Norway, we the registries have um, have an um, um, have a license to use, but it is there is it is necessary to have a license for using the EQ five D. Uh, we can as well mention that uh, 
if the registries use uh, eq 5 me by the license given nationally, uh, they have to give as well some data back to the EQ, to the Eurocall, uh, the overall Eurocall organization. Then we have the run toll pros and cons. Uh, the run toll is as well a generic questionnaire producing health utility and a generic health score. Seven questions with six answer options, a little bit longer than the EQ5D, but uh, studies have taken, uh, looked into how much time people are using by answering, and the time is not longer compared to the EQ5D. There is an extensive use, but somewhat less than the EQ5D. Many populations can be compared, and there is no license. Uh, the run toll does not capture all aspects of health status, but to a larger extent mental health and fatigue than the EQ5D. And ceiling effects as well on the run toll needs to be considered. Um, uh, this is an overview from the registries reporting use of EQ5D data per category of registry and category of use from Sweden and we see that from all registries, the 41 registries, uh, 22 use reporting use of EQ5D and 10 of them have used it in intervention studies, um, five in health economic studies, 10 for quality indicators, seven benchmarking, six in quality improvement, and seven at an individual level. So a relatively low numbers. Um, oh, the text is not there, no. Uh, nevertheless, a represent, the paper is pointing out that representatives from several registries reported that it is unclear if the data from the EQ5D are being used for any purpose or that it is not being used at all. And I think this is important to taking into account. Why are we collecting data and it's important to use the data? Um, how do you utilize all the data gathered with a generic PROM? Is it used too little? Yeah, we have to reflect on that. Um, and we would like to, to say yes, as well generic questionnaires are used in clinical consultations or changing in clinical practice. This is not a situation in Norway. The disease specific questionnaires are used in clinical consultations guiding changing clinical practices and they are used to uh, within one patient group nationally and between countries national and internationally um, for the eq5d and the generic questionnaires i have given you some examples yes this was my presentation so far uh, so I would like to ask if there were questions. So far, this was my presentation. Thank you, Mario Lane. Very interesting and uh, well prepared presentation. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions from the chat or at least? I have, of course, one or actually many in my mind. <laughs> we don't have <laughs> too much time, but do you have any uh, registries for uh, social? Social services. No. Yes. No. Uh, no, no. We don't have, but it does uh, exist, but not in the um, uh, not in the quality registry. Uh, uh, how do you say yeah, that? The not yes, in this house. <laughs> maybe we should say the the formal name is the National Medical Quality Registries as well. So uh, they are not under this umbrella in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I interrupted you, Inga Lisa. No, that's fine. No, that, that's fine. Hey, uh, and uh, when we're talking about generic prompts, and uh, today the presentation has been about national quality registers, but what about the uh, the other health services that are not uh, under any 
National Quality Register. Do you know that, do they have any discussion in Norway about choosing one generic prom for health services? All the politics would like to have one generic prom, but we uh, we do, uh, do not have that and uh, we do not recommend it either. But sorry, Ingrid Lisa. No, I'm just going to say that we are included in that line of work uh, in the Norwegian uh, um, uh, Health uh, 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 health Directorate. What's the name? The English. Director of Health. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and there are massive discussions nationally on how to how do we handle this that uh, people are going to answer questionnaires at home and we are going to make decisions based on those uh, answers um, that work has been going on for a couple of years um, i won't say we are close to an end but there's an ongoing discussion that we are included in and what we we'll like to prevent uh, from happening is that uh, one in primary care or in uh, in um, in the specialized care kind of invent their own questionnaires as they go along because we see a tendency uh, that that is what's happening and it has to be stopped. <laughs> yeah, but I have a question for you, Lisa. Um, oh, <laughs> oh! But why did you in Finland disregard the RAN 12? Or because that's um, it, it's quite common in in Norway. Excuse me, I didn't. Uh, why, why did you? Hear, yeah. Why did you choose not to uh, proceed with the RAN 12 or the SF SF 12 as a well, narrow prom? That is a good question, but uh, well, this is not. Uh, official opinion of uh, of THL but I think it is because in Finland we we don't have really that much history with the measure okay we have certain measures in Finland that are being already implemented or, or there's a long history with them and uh we just maybe hmm. yeah I can't really uh yeah. give you a thorough answer for that okay. yeah, but that? thank you Mm. That was actually, I think that that was at least one one reason. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have to thank you all for being so active, and uh, it was good seeing you. And uh, I think we'll get back to you <laughs> in this. And uh, in this webinar, uh, we'll move on to a short break. I think maybe we should take eight minutes and we'll get back at uh, one.